It's Tuesday, October 11th. From inside the WTOP newsroom, this is the DMV Download, brought to you by the men and women of Steamfitters Local 602. Get an estimate and learn more at steamfitters-602.org. Today, a home on an island with a mysterious past dating back to the Civil War is going up for sale for the first time in a half century. As WTOP's John Doman tells us, the curiously named Tippity Witchity Island was home to a brothel and a whiskey distillery. I guess that area is sort of frequented by pirates and, and other less than savory characters anyway. And we'll tell you about a 120-year-old Chesapeake Bay lighthouse with some odd restrictions, and it just sold. WTOP's Michelle Bash tells us why the new owner has to share their keys with the Coast Guard and the Navy. The lighthouse is located in a surface warfare area for the U.S. Navy. That means they do surface warfare testing. Thanks for joining us. I'm Megan Cloherty. And I'm Luke Garrett. In the St. Mary's River Sanctuary, where the Potomac River meets the Chesapeake Bay, you'll find a five-acre private island with a dock, a pool, a modest three-bedroom house, and a lot of history and some mystery. Yeah, WTP's John Doman is here to tell us about the private island that few of us have heard of, but holds a place in Maryland history. John, there are different stories, basically. About a lot this of different stories. Tippity Witchity Island. What a name. <laughs> um, where arrowheads and Native American pottery shards have been discovered. But as far as who first purchased the island, it, the land records go back to the Civil War. So what they know about this island, and, and there's a lot that they don't, uh, well, the, uh, the real estate agent told me, you know, figuring out what's fact and what's fiction is sort of on the, you know, it's up to your imagination, yeah. I guess. Wow. But w- we know that it was a guy that fought in the Civil War. Don't know for who. Uh, who. He could have been a Confederate, could have been a Union guy. But uh, once the Civil War ended, once he was done in battle, he needed a place to uh, get involved in a little debaucherous activity. This is, debaucherous. Captain, this is Captain Henry Hellgate. Sounds like a very upstanding guy. <laughs> but it turns out somebody like that was into bootlegging and, and you know, had his own little distillery. During was, Prohibition. Was into wow. some bordellos on the island. Mm-hmm. You know, I guess all that kind of got shunned out of places like Alexandria. Hard to imagine. So they moved it down to this island, a wow. bordello, bootlegging. You know, I guess that area it's, was sort of frequented by pirates and, and other less than savory characters anyway. So <laughs> wow. I know. So let's just... Build this little little thing on this little secluded island. It's so funny though on this on the Sotheby's uh, website. It's like you know watermen and those who did business on the on the. <laughs> they day, were bootlegging. Were like, uh... They didn't say what kind of business, <laughs> but you know, in the grand scheme of things, for for the last several decades now, it's lived a much tamer life, being sort of just a, a vacation abode. And now it's your chance. If you don't like your neighbors, don't have to worry about it here. And, you know, to me, I didn't even know that you could have a private island just within the DMV region. You know, (laughs) I usually think you need a plane at least to get a private island. But here it is really in, you know, where the Potomac meets the Chesapeake. You talk to the realtor, you know, what he have to say. So it's we're talking almost five acres of land. It's pretty up the St. Mary's River. Not that the St. Mary's River is a very long one. Yeah. Um, So it's a little bit north of St. Mary's City, which, you know, you have the college down there and not too much else. You're not too far away from... I guess Leonard Town in Lexington Park, the Pax River Air Base, all that sort of nearby. The house itself, yes, it's in the water, but really you're only talking like a 30-second, minute-long motorboat ride from the dock hmm. to where this house is. You do need a boat, though. I mean, yeah, you, you, get- you have to get there. <laughs> you can only get there by boat. That is one of the things. If you're thinking about buying this, you know, you might have to have a boat as well. <laughs> but otherwise, you have five acres. You have this, uh, like we said, I think, uh, you know, the three-bedroom house. It's a house. It, it's it's not a mansion or anything like that, but he pointed out that there is enough space that if you wanted to build more, oh know, wow, make yourself a family compound or whatever you want to do, that there's a lot of flexibility there. It's really a one of a kind opportunity. This is not just a house in a subdivision or even a beautiful house on the waterfront. There's a pool in the ground there. You know, you look at the pictures. The land itself looks pretty nice. They, they certainly. Whoever owns it certainly has the money to keep it maintained. I don't know how they get the lawnmowers and all the landscaping out yeah. there. But again, that's that's not something somebody in my uh, income bracket has ever had to worry about. <laughs> it's available as, you know, whether it's your, your new work from home office and you want to live there permanently. So or funny. Or if you want to uh, just have a nice little vacation spot. A little more history on it. It was first called Lynch Island in 1879. Um, and then in the 50s, 1950s, another owner named Ernest Dickey bought it, wired the place for electricity, which I guess was a big deal. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's fully wired for all that <laughs> stuff. it's on an island, right? Yeah. Um, and then the cu- current owners um, bought it when they saw a classified ad in Washingtonian magazine. This you is know, getting a little more play. Yeah, it's, you know, back before the days of Craigslist, I guess. 
Oh, I love Craigslist. Oh my gosh, don't get them started. John, Megan, I don't know. We should, we should all go in on this Wait, house. Wait, how much is it? <laughs> it's two point one million dollars. Okay. <laughs> and, and and they admit whole newsroom it. should go in on it. Maybe. They admit it. They didn't really know what they could really compare to around here to come up with that price. It's it's already drawing interest. There's a showing later today. I have to say, I mean, nothing like, nothing against the owners, but the house is very small. I mean, it's a very small little three bedroom. I think it's like one bathroom, right? I mean, you might want to build uh, more. Yeah, there, there's plenty of room to build more that they've said. You know, it's it's 90 minutes away. But yeah, like I guess if if you want flexibility, if you want your own little compound and stuff, somebody that has the money can make it work. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. it's it's just fun to talk about. Totally, that's true. I, what's coming in my head is you know you just have a big family. Everyone you know buys into it. That's that's all you need. A little family getaway island. That's that's what I'm thinking. That that was one of the things he tried to uh, try to put into my ear that that's a possibility. Oh Certainly, really? You know, obviously, you're trying to drum up interest. There's, yeah, that's true. You have people that are interested in the place. The house itself is is maybe on the smaller side. So then you start talking about all the what ifs and the possibilities. And mm-hmm. if you got $2.1 million to start, certainly you're going to have the money to make yeah. whatever changes you want to do to begin with. And depending on how much interest there is, you know, the sale price could go certainly above $2.1 million too. So. All right. John Doman telling us about our dreams for Tippity Witchity Island. We'll see who actually buys it. I guess we'll probably won't know who will buy it. No no idea who's going to buy it. And, and just as an aside, I don't know how many times you guys have ever hung out in St. Mary's County. <laughs> and um, actually, I've, I've hung out in St. Mary's County. Uh, once. The, <laughs> once. Th- th- those, of us, those of us that sort of don't have the income to live on this island know about the green door. It's not too far away from there. <laughs> a, a landmark establishment. Of course you know the bar they, nearby. I love it. They actually have real flooring in there now. So <laughs> That's a win. John, thanks. And after the break, we'll tell you about a once lonely lighthouse sitting in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay that's become the subject of a bidding war. Backed by the experience of its hardworking members, Steamfitters Local 602 is ready to take on your next commercial heating, cooling, HVAC, or refrigeration project. Steamfitters Local 602 adds value to our community through its partnerships with local contractors and building owners, all while keeping the focus on improving the lives of its members and their families throughout the DMV. For work that's on time and on budget, go to steamfitters-602.org to schedule your next project. That's steamfitters-602.org. Steamfitters Local 602, changing lives. I'm Paul Wagner. Join me as I dig deep into the mysterious case of the Potomac River Rapist. Listen to Unknown Subject. Season 3 of WTOP's award-winning American Nightmare podcast series, available now wherever you get your podcasts. A lonely lighthouse in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay became the subject of conversation this summer when the government listed it for sale for $15,000. For a month, it went without any offers, but we learned last week it just got sold for 10 times that amount. There were a couple of big contingencies when it came to buying the Hooper Island Lighthouse on the Chesapeake Bay, which we should say is a working lighthouse. Um, joining us to talk about it is WTOP's Michelle Bash, who covered the story and is just like super interested in it. Michelle, thanks for being here. Absolutely. Um, so we were all interested when the lighthouse was first listed for sale, and it's not in the best of shape and needs a little rehab, but can you tell us what we know about the Spark Plug Lighthouse? Well, it's 120 years old, um, built in 1902. It's four stories. It's a caisson-style lighthouse, so it sticks straight up out of the bay. This is in the middle of the bay. Um, it has no dock. There's just a um, like a ship ladder, it's called, where you would just climb up a ladder to get into it. <laughs> um, so in terms of even visiting the lighthouse, it would be difficult. Right. You definitely need a boat to get there. And we mentioned there yes. were some significant drawbacks to owning this four-story lighthouse. And some of them do with where it's located and, you know, what's being done around it. Right. The new owner, who has not been revealed yet, we don't know who it is, has to sign a agreement with the U.S. Navy. Now, the reason for that is the lighthouse is located in a surface warfare area for the U.S. Navy. That means they do surface warfare testing in the area of the lighthouse. So they want to be in touch with whoever visits and maintains the lighthouse, the the new owner, in case they're scheduling testing, they want you to clear out because you could be in the way of their testing. And that's why you can't stay there, right? I mean, which I think was like the biggest thing to me is you're not actually allowed to overnight there. Exactly. Uh, I was told the only way you could overnight there 
as if you were doing construction work, rehab work inside, and you know you were working all day, and I guess you had to stay overnight because you were all tuckered out. Yeah, but mm. you can't stay there. You can't have it as like um, a residence. You can't uh, rent it out as an Airbnb. Such a bummer. So of <laughs> course, you know, we were going around the newsroom trying to come up with things we could do with this lighthouse. Right, it was right. fun. I mean, the Airbnb thing it sounds so cool, but yeah, that's a huge drawback. Right. I mean, especially when you consider someone paid, you know, six figures for this place. I mean, what what are the reasons behind that? And as a cherry on top, it's also a National Historic Landmark. Does that bring but, any, you know, requirements with that designation? Yeah. In order to maintain it, uh, the new owner needs to follow historic preservation rules so if there's any, you know, repairs that need to be made, if there are any additions that person wants to make, they have to go through a process where it's approved mm -hmm. uh, by a, maybe a, a historic preservation board in Dorchester County, Maryland. This this is considered the, the area of Dorchester, part of Dorchester County, even though it's surrounded by water. So they would have to get permission through Dorchester County to do anything. The General Services Administration is actually what, you know, the, the agency that put it up for sale. Um, but it took a while to get bids, Michelle. Like We were watching this thing and it didn't get bids for like a month or something. Um, how much did it sell for? And um, do we know how that process went? It didn't get bids for, I believe, almost a month. And then uh, September came around because uh, the auction started in early August. Yeah, August 8th is when it started and it ended September 23rd. And how it works is... If there's no bids, they can extend it. Um, you know, they set an end date and this auction actually went past the end date because what happens is when people start to bid um, and there's activity, then the GSA extends the auction a little longer to see if there are more bids. Yeah. Um, so it got extended an extra two days and it ended with a closing bid of $192,000. And was there a bidding war? Do we know any of the details, you know, about that? Or was it just some big roller, you know, high roller, just like, boom, I want this lighthouse? I believe there were four different bidders. Um, and there was a bit of a bidding war. There was a back and forth at the end between two of them, I believe, wow. um, if I'm remembering right. So there were two people that apparently really wanted it and went back and forth. And, and then the auction closed. And there you have it. So it's I'm really interested to see what happens with this place next? Because as we talked about, there's so many limitations on what you can do. Um, one thing we haven't talked about uh, in detail really is it is a working lighthouse. That means the Coast Guard has to maintain the light at the top because it's used for navigation. Um, so the Coast Guard needs uh, to get in there and repair, operate. You know, the light operates itself. It's a um, automatic light. But they need to get in there in case, um, you know, right. it needs repair or upkeep. And so they need access to your lighthouse. <laughs> right. In other words, the Coast Guard, the Navy, and you all have keys to this lighthouse you just spent nearly yes. $200,000 on. Wow. That's, yeah. yeah. You know what else is so interesting is that I was reading the listing and it says, I mean, you're not buying any land. You're buying like a little structure. The listing says, quote, the underlying submerged land will remain in the ownership of the U.S. government per the deed <laughs> dated in April 1924. It just seems like such. I mean, that, maybe that's why is it's just such a cool thing to own. But, Michelle, have you heard of this happening before? This just seemed like such a, an odd thing. Um, I have heard, yes, of private owners buying lighthouses. Um, in fact, the uh, man I inter interviewed with the GSA um, was telling me about, I believe it's two or three other lighthouses in California that sold just this past year. Um, I don't know if they were all for uh, sold to individuals, yeah. but um, I have heard of individuals owning lighthouses, even in the Chesapeake Bay, and just keeping them for themselves and for friends to go visit. Um, there's another lighthouse that is owned by a group. Uh, that one is off of Annapolis. Um, that is being kept for historic preservation reasons, just for visitors to see um, it's being kept as just as it was mm. in the olden days. Um, so people can see what it was like for a old lighthouse keeper to live in a place like that in, in the middle of the bay wow. during storms. Oh, my goodness. That's so, um, cool. so that's really interesting. Lighthouses, they do capture the imagination, you know, and I think that's why Thank we're you. here talking about it and why people are putting down a lot of money for them. It's funny, too, Michelle. We were um, we were looking to see what else was for sale from the GSA. And Luke is like obsessed with Craigslist. And this is like <laughs> a, a deep dive. 
<laughs> I mean, the I stuff almost that missed you'll this find, interview. I was like just deep. Into I know that. we I almost like, missed the interview because we were like on this website. But there are no other lighthouses for sale. But if you want to check it out, it's called realestatesales.gov. Um, and they have a lot of, you know, U.S. government property that's for sale. <laughs> Michelle Bash letting us know what it's like to uh, go after a lighthouse. We need to find the people yeah. who actually own the lighthouses around us and make friends. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I want to go out there. The problem is, like I said, we got a ship ladder. If we're going to that lighthouse, there's just a ship ladder um, that goes straight into the water. Uh, so you've got to <laughs> apparently take a boat out there and anchor it and then get in a smaller boat <laughs> and somehow get over to the ladder and then like tie off your boat. <laughs> sounds fun, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a challenge. Thanks, Michelle, for bringing us the story. We appreciate it. Thank you. And before we go, Megan Cloherty is back, back from her weekend <laughs> trip, which started off kind of rough. I had such a hard time. Friday morning, we took the long weekend. So Friday morning, we oversleep, by, by the way, by like a half hour. Ugh. Not like devastatingly, but I was. it was an early morning flight and Anxiety the worst started. thing happens. Yes. Exactly. So you wake up like, oh, no. And so we're rushing to get out the door. We get out the door. I'm like, okay. All of our buffer time is gone. But if everything goes <laughs> perfectly, which obviously, you know, it doesn't. We'll be fine. We'll make it to Dulles. Oh, man. So we're driving to Dulles, and you hear this, like, Oh, no. And I was like, I literally was like, no. Not the tire. And and then you hear, and I was like, oh, crap. So we pull over. Tire's totally totally flat. Uh, And we're, like, on a little bit of a, like, an incline, I guess. Right. So we kept trying to use the jack, and this crappy jack just kept, like, folding. Mm. Like, it wasn't able to, like, get a flat surface. Yeah, exactly. So we call, so this is like seven in the morning. And you guys are on the expressway? We're on the toll road, on like oh, the side God. of the toll road. So we're calling for help because we obviously need somebody who has like a legit jack to come help us. Yeah. And nobody's open because it's seven in the morning. Ugh. So we wait for two hours on just hanging out, missing our flight, by the way. You see the, the plane. Right. We see the planes <laughs> go by. I'm like, there it is. Finally get the tire changed, uh, and then obviously have to go buy a new tire, have to rebook both flights uh, for my husband and I, and pay the change fee. So we're just sitting there. Now we're hungry, and I'm like, I guess we're going out to lot. Like, I guess we're just spending- <laughs> So you spending guys had like eight hours, right? All of our money. Yeah, the next flight that was like reasonable to go out on was like eight hours later. Wow. Um, but yeah. what'd you do in that time? This is my favorite part of the story. <laughs> so we went and got like a bagel sandwiches or whatever, and then I, I was like, well, I don't want to drive all the way back home, because we were out in, I think, Sterling? Or- yeah. So we went to Top Golf. Boom. A little <laughs> celebration, a little flat tire change flight celebration. Why not? It, well, it was one of those things like you have the day off. I I, I can't actually be where I want to be, but yeah. what can we do that's fun, you know? So yeah, we went to Top Golf and then eventually made it to the airport. Yep, making lemonade out of lemons <laughs> there. Out of rotten Luke. lemons. Yeah, very pulpy lemonade. Well, I like the story. But the trip was fun. We went to Colorado and it all worked out. So Boom. Yeah. That'll do it for us today on the DMV <laughs> Download. This show is brought to you by Steamfitters Local 602. Our managing editor is Craig Schwab and our music is by Real World. Leave us a review and rate our show if you get the chance. And thank you to those listeners who sent us some story ideas. We want more. So send us those, and we're working on the story ideas you sent us. Uh, We're posting on social media every day. Become a VIP listener at dmvdownload.com. The DMV Download is a product of WTOP News. Listen on 103.5 FM in the D.C. area, 107.7 FM in Virginia, 103.9 FM in Frederick, Maryland, online at WTOP.com, and on the WTOP News app. Have a good night, and we'll see you tomorrow. 